I can test one, two. All right. Thank you all for coming. It's a great pleasure to introduce Jack Petrowski, who is a graduate student from Johns Hopkins and is here today to tell us about um, DMDs. Wow, from movie projectors to multi-object spectrographs. Jack has an undergrad de undergraduate degree from the University of Rochester in optics and with minors in physics and astronomy, and uh, has been working here with uh, Sheck and Jeff on uh, a spectrograph. I think he's working with Anna now and uh, has been doing a really wonderful job on instrumentation. So uh, thank you, Jack, and looking forward to your talk. Thank you for the introduction. All right, so I'm gonna talk about micromirrors. So something very interesting, which I think is a great way to kind of kick this off. So digital micromirror devices, I start with movie projectors, but they're used in all sorts of projectors and they're actually used in that projector right here. So I encourage you after the talk, if you get real close and you see what looks like pixels, those are actually DMDs. So that's what this in the background is. It's kind of a more zoomed in uh, picture of these micromirror devices. So a slightly more contrasty version is this is what a digital micromirror device looks like up close, right? So we have a hundred microns in the corner. They're pretty small and the mirrors tend to be about 10 to 13 and a half microns in diameter. So if you kind of step back, uh, this is what the entire device looks like. And across this device right here, there's 2 million little mirrors. So, well, what do they do? DMDs are spatial light modulators, which is just a fancy term for meaning they're gonna either let light through or they're gonna block it. They're changing the direction or the phase. And in our case, uh, we use it to modulate the amplitude of light incident on the device. The way they do this is each of those little squares that I showed, they're tiny little mirrors. And this is kind of a zoomed in section on the right side. Um, and they can tilt in two directions. They can go plus or minus 12 degrees for a device about their diagonal. And we use that to either direct light into an instrument like a spectrograph um, or to direct it away if we're not interested in that light. So up top here, you can kind of see this in action. Uh, and this is how it's used in the projector case, where when a mirror flips on, it shines light on the screen. And when it flips off, like these right here, um, it's not showing any light and it's dumping it somewhere into the, uh, the projector itself. So you can take a lot of these together and you can essentially modulate the, the pattern or what you see on the screen. And when you go further and you have even more, that's when you can use them in projectors. So you can see right here is a DMD where the mirrors are flipping quickly uh, in order to show the Warner Brothers logo at the beginning of a movie. So that's great. Now we know how DMDs work. Everyone's an expert, but how do we use them in spectrographs? Well, to do that, we have to build one. <laughs> yes, do you have a question? Yeah, Oops. Well, I remember being shocked when I heard that yeah. So the question was, these mirrors are pretty tiny. We know that large mirrors like in the Magellan telescope, so we have to wash the primary in order to keep the throughput high. So do we have to wash these mirrors? And the answer is no. So on this device to the left, there's a window that's part of the package. So they're completely protected uh, by that window. Now, if you take the window off, um, well, you still can't wash them, they're too small, but you've probably destroyed the device at that point. All right, so uh, let's build a spectrograph and let's see how these are actually used. So to start, I have a nice drawing of a telescope looking to space, where space for us is to the left. Um, and essentially what the telescope is doing is it's taking an angle out in space, such as a star, and it's converting it to a position on our image. So if we have another star that's at a different location or a different angle, uh, it's gonna put it at a different place on our image. So roughly to the right is kind of what our image would look like uh, at the focal plane. If we'd like to do some more science with this, we need to disperse the starlight and then we can get spectrums. So I put a little prism here and we get two great spectrums, but they're overlapping. So that's no good. So what do we do next? Well, we have to go back to our image and now we need to add a spatial light modulator. And the way we usually do that is we just have a slit mask. So if you take a metal sheet like we do at Magellan and you cut slits in it, you've modulated the light. Sli light is either going through or it's getting reflected and blocked. So we have our image, we have a singular star, our science target, 
and we're getting rid of the, the unwanted target. But we still have to find some way to disperse the spectrum. So what we typically do in a spectrograph is we then collimate this light, we add a disperser, and then we need to add a camera in order to recreate the image of the dispersed light, and we image that onto a detector. So now, if we take a look at our image viewer, this is what the CCD would see. We see one star, not the unwanted star. There's no overlapping spectrum. And now we can do our science. And we're blocking out a lot of the background that we're not interested in. So if you project this onto the sky, let's say we have a little bit more of a crowded field, because you're probably not just having two stars. You can put your slit on our science target. And then on the left, we get our spectrum. Now, that's great. But usually, we want to be a little bit more efficient with our telescope time. And if you have a slit mask or some other spatial light modulator, you can cut multiple slits. So in this test case, we can cut five slits. We get five nice spectra. But we still have five targets that are unobserved. So if we were interested in imaging or taking a spectra of this entire cluster, then what we need to do is take multiple exposures. Uh, and this is just to make sure that we're not having spectra overlap. But what if there was a way? that we could take the light that we're rejecting at the slit mask and use it for other science. So let's go back to our block diagram. Well, not really block. I'll call it a cartoon of our spectrograph. And we're going to change it up a little. And this time, I'm going to use a DMD and show how using a DMD would be different than a typical slit mask spectrograph. In this configuration, we have to add an optical instrument I'll call a focal reducer. The reason why we do this is if you recall the picture I showed earlier with the DMD in my hand, it's pretty small. And the focal plane at a telescope like Magellan is much larger than that. So we use a focal reducer essentially to shrink the image. And this allows us to put more field of view onto the DMD, which we're using as our slit mask. From here, instead of either letting light pass or blocking it, we really redirect it into two different directions. So we would have what would be generally considered an on state, would go, which would go to our spectrograph, which is shown here as transmitting light down, or rather reflecting it. Um, and then we also have our redirected off state, which is putting light into a light dump. So from here, we can just construct our spectrograph as we did before. We have our collimator, we have a disperser, we have a camera, and we record the image and we get our spectra. But we can do a little bit better than that. We're getting rid of this light, but now instead of kind of, you know, reflecting it back into the telescope and into space, uh, we're valuing the time of the photons that it took them to get to the telescope, and we're going to record them. So we can put a camera there. So now we have one instrument, but it's really two separate ones. We have a spectrograph and an imager, but it's using the same light field. So this is great because now when we look at the actual CCDs, we have our five spectra on the left. But on the right is no longer just projected onto the sky. This is what the CCD of the imager sees. So you're going to be dark where we have our slits placed on our objects, but the other five stars we could do photometry with. So let's say we're taking an hour-long exposure to get the, the spectra on the left side. Well, I can take a number of shorter exposures with Sloan filters on the right side to do photometry, or I could do some narrowband imaging with H-alpha, uh, or so on and so forth. So when it comes to either let's say you want crowded field spectroscopy or you're doing survey science, it's a, it's a more efficient use of the, the photons that you have incident. OK, so now we know how we use DMDs. So what's the point of simulating them? Well, the thing is, DMDs have some pretty non-intuitive effects when it comes to how they interact with the light. And because the mirrors are so small, uh, this causes interference effects uh, that are at the micromirror array. So it's important when we're designing these sensitive astronomical instruments to understand how these interference effects will affect our throughput, our image quality, and ultimately the stray light. And that'll tell us how well these can act as slit masks. So to do that, we need to better understand the micromirrors themselves. We'll zoom in a bit. And like I mentioned, there's 2 million in that picture. So we're going to just take a small square of them. So the on the right, or the center image, is a microscope image of a uh, micromirror array with a 3 by 3 grid. And on the right is a snippet of simulation that we'll use to actually simulate the near-field optical interactions. And we'll project that to the far field. And that's what we'd use in the instrument. But I want to focus on the center, the microscope image. I flashed this image before. 
And I would love to zoom in a little bit more, but when I was taking this photo, there's that cover glass I talked about. And the cover glass is a little thick. It doesn't interact well with the microscope and it causes kind of a blurry image when I get real close because it adds these aberrations I can't correct for. Long story short, the way to fix this is to break the window. <laughs> so we've removed the window on this device and yes, we have broken it. This is not something you would do for an actual instrument, but it's great to do some uh, forensic analysis of DMDs. And the great thing is we don't have to feel too bad about doing this because they're relatively cheap when it comes to instrument costs. Usually you're talking about instruments like with Samos, which is a multi-million dollar instrument. Meanwhile, these devices end up costing a few thousand dollars. So in order to do some you know, forensic analysis, we don't feel quite as bad. My advisor, Steve Smee, uh, also did the courtesy of running his finger along the DMD. Uh, <laughs> And that provides a whole different analysis. <laughs> so this is a much more interesting photo, although it is never you know, the case that we'd use it. Um, but it tells us a lot about the actual physical makeup of the micromirrors. And I know what everyone's thinking. They look like cheeses. <laughs> and it's true, they do. They're these thin little mirrors and they have a small hole in the middle. And the hole is actually part of the support structure. And I'll show that in a second. But I talked about this analysis actually being useful. And what I'll do is I'll show the diagram that I had previously. It's a bit small. I had it on the other page. Um, but what you can see is here, uh, the face of the micro mirror in the model, you can see that here and all over. But you can also see other parts of the structure, including the, the yoke uh, and the, the bus that it sits on. And this is kind of how they tilt. So they tilt about here. They'll go in these two directions. Uh, and then underneath is a, a CMOS like circuit board. Um, and because these devices function electrostatically, a charge is applied and it tips the mirror in one direction or the other, and they have little landing pads. So you can control really well that plus or minus 12 degrees, um, but in the off state, so no voltage is applied, they kind of sit flat. It's not super well controlled, so we don't use that um, in instrumentation. We would just use the controlled state, so the plus or minus 12 degrees. Yes? Before you go. Too far in. Can you just say in two minutes how these things are built? How are they assembled, for example? Yeah, so these are MEMS devices, and they tend to be grown um, from the, the substrate, and it's kind of layer by layer. Um, is about to, I don't know if I can fill two minutes. Sorry, the question was, how are these things built? Um, and the answer is they're, they're somewhat grown in a sense, and there's a uh, um, you know, the aluminum is deposited onto these devices, but you basically have a silicon base and then you have aluminum deposited and you build up the devices that way. Um, I don't know if that's satisfactory. If not, I could look it up and tell you later. <laughs> um, so for the, the purposes going forward, we're interested in the, the physical structure. And we're now able to get a better understanding of these mirrors because when I started working on this, I hadn't seen the destroyed view and I had thought these things were a lot thicker. But this device in particular, um, these micro mirrors are 10 microns across. We use 13 and a half, we want bigger mirrors, but this device is 10 microns. So the way that they're kind of stacked on each other, these things are very thin, like on the order of one micron less than a micron. And that wasn't apparent to me before my advisor destroyed one of these. So is very helpful in the end. So from here, uh, using what we've learned, you can reconstruct a model. And this model is both based on you know, white papers from Texas Instrument uh, and conversations with some of the engineers. But Texas Instrument tends to be a bit tight-lipped about their technology because it's, you know, it's their IP, it makes them money. Um, and unfortunately, astronomy doesn't. So <laughs> uh, we have to do you know, a little investigating some conversations and stuff like that in order to, to build up the model to the best of our ability. And this is essentially what we've come up with. Uh, this is a CAD model showing a single uh, micro mirror. And now we go from the, the physical, well, not the physical world, the virtual physical world to the virtual optical world. <laughs> so what I'm interested in is I want to see how these devices interact with light when we image a star. So in this simple case, um, we're taking a diffraction limited point source. So it's an airy disk, it is a PSF, it's not just a plane wave. Um, but we're going to essentially take the light from our telescope that we re-imaged and we're going to put it onto the micro mirror array. 
So this is showing a five by five array, which is the region we're simulating. And I've taken one mirror in the center and I flipped it on towards our spectrograph. And all the other mirrors are off towards our imager in this case. So what I'm interested in is I only want the light from that central mirror to go into the spectrograph and I'd like to block everything else. And we're gonna try to figure out how well we can do that. So the way the simulation works is incident light goes here. This is where we want it to go to the spectrograph. And I suppose I should have flipped through these while I was explaining it, but and then we have incident light onto the off state mirrors. They're going to the imager, but things aren't always as we hope. And some amount of light from each one will go into the opposite channel. This sets our contrast. And the contrast tells us how well the DMD acts as a slip mask. It's a measure of the efficacy of the, the DMD. So the two primary metrics we use in order to um, characterize these devices is the efficiency, which is the fraction of incident light that'll go into our spectrograph. And then the contrast, which is the amount of light from the imager facing mirrors that go into the spectrograph. So it's kind of like a crosstalk between the mirrors and that's bad. So we want efficiency to be high and we want the contrast to be high because it's a ratio. Okay, now I'll show you what the simulations actually look like because we've kind of built up to that point. So this is showing a cross section. The Z direction is exaggerated here, um, but I'm taking a bunch of these little micro mirrors, slicing them right down the center about their diagonal in the tilt direction. And I flip them all plus 12 degrees. Again, Z is exaggerated. This is not 12 degrees. Um, and what I can do is I can illuminate them with my point source. So I'll take a wave packet uh, and I will shine it onto the micro mirrors. And we can see, so this is the uh, electric field intensity. It's a cross section of it. And we can see how it interacts with these mirrors in the near field. And the takeaway from this is we started with this single wave packet and we've managed to split it up. So this is generally not great news for us because now we've taken our, you know, our coherent star and we've split the light. And now we have a path difference between these two bundles of light. And when we have this path difference, they're going to interfere with each other. And this is also a basic operating principle of diffraction gratings. And at first order, the DMD behaves a lot like a diffraction grating. So we wanna be able to measure this. The simulations show and kind of first order sanity checks show that we're gonna have this interference and we're gonna have some diffractive effects. And we need to be able to characterize these well for our instruments but first, let's measure it. And a way you can do that is you can put them into a, a reflective spectrometer. You can shine some light from your spectrometer onto the DMD, and then you collect that light. So this is uh, uh, just a typical spectrometer. I don't know if there's many typical spectrometers. <laughs> Um, but anyways, so what we would expect to see is this device is going to tell us how the efficiency, right, the, the amount of light that we've collected from our optics, so we're measuring the efficiency, is going to change with respect to wavelength. And what we see is it changes a lot and not how mirrors typically behave, right? We have this really strange uh, sinusoidal behavior, uh, and that's a, a direct effect that comes from the diffraction that happens at the, the micro mirror phase. And you can see these peaks. So these peaks all come from high order diffraction. And I would like to point out, and I'll talk a little bit more about it later, um, but this effect is greatly exaggerated when you have like a slow beam. And what that means in astronomy is you have the angle, the cone of light that illuminates it um, is very shallow. So uh, the slowest beam possible is the laser, right? There's basically, there's no, it's a, you know, there's no angle. And then as you get faster and faster, you have a wider cone. So the closer you get to a laser, aka the slower your beam is, uh, the more pronounced these diffraction effects are going to be. Uh, and in this uh, test setup that I shown here, we're illuminating it with an F10. So F10 is really slow. It's standard for a telescope, but as a reminder, we're going to uh, we have the focal reducer, and the focal reducer will take something like an F10 telescope, and it might make it F3. So this effect uh, is dramatic in the test setup, but it's less dramatic, still present and still apparent um, in an actual instrument design. So let's talk about an instrument, a real instrument. It is a model, but it does exist, I can assure you. Uh, an instrument that we finished building uh, a couple of weeks ago, and we plan to send to Chile to the SOAR telescope uh, in a couple of weeks. 
So SAMOS is a DMD-based multi-object spectrograph and imager. Uh, yes. Sorry, was it F, is F3 faster or slower than F10? Ah, yes. F3 is faster. So the cone of light, is, so the question is, was F3, is F3 faster than F10? And the answer is yes. So the lower your F number, the faster an optic is, which also means the cone of light uh, subtends a larger angle. Uh, if you're familiar with numerical aperture, uh, it varies inversely uh, comparatively. So let's run the simulation for SAMOS. Now, SAMOS, instead of an F10 beam, has an F4 beam. The telescope itself is F16. We have a factor of four focal reducer, and we illuminate the DMD with an F4 beam, uh, which is like plus or minus, I think like uh, seven and a quarter degrees or so. It probably doesn't mean anything to anyone. But uh, so this is the, the simulation that we get. And on the top, we have our efficiency. Now I've got two lines plotted. I have the multiple micromirrors and the single micromirror. And the reason I've done this is I talked about interference occurring when we have a path length difference between light reflected by multiple mirrors. Um, but if we have a single mirror, there's no path length difference. Think of like running a double slit in a multi-slit experiment. When you have a single slit, you're not getting these fringes. But when you have multiple slits, you start to get these fringes. And that's essentially the same thing, uh, or these diffraction peaks. And it's essentially the same thing that's happening here. Um, on the bottom is a uh, simulation of contrast. And this is something that's much more difficult to simulate because it's very sensitive uh, and it's very computationally expensive. So getting this plot, which is not very pretty, still took you know my computer running for a few, like 72 hours or so, um, and a desktop and a little space heater, as I like to call it. Um, now it's you know less obvious taking away uh, on the top, right? There's very clear features that come from the peaks, but on the bottom, uh, it's a lot of scattered light and you generally see uh, the trend that the contrast is a little bit better in the blue um, than you get in the red. But I would encourage you when you look at contrast plots to kind of like squint at them. You wanna see the general trend. I wouldn't start to look into like individual features because uh, you know the, the model isn't really at that resolution. Um, uh, that we can pull uh, data from. But what I can do and what I have done recently is I've worked on measuring. Uh, do you have a question? question about the meaning of contrast? Yes. Is this the contrast from single? Like you have 2 million of these. Mm -hmm. Is this the contrast when you illuminate the entire array and you deflect one mirror and you get the ratio of? Uh, the contrast to the entire array, or is it with a pair of mirrors? Uh, so the question was basically, uh, how are we defining contrast? Is it multiple mirrors? Um, and the, the answer is, uh, yes, it is when, so these simulations, uh, especially in contrast, all mirrors are flipped on or off. Uh, so in this case, we're still taking uh, an object more like a star, so it's not like a flat field. Um, but what I've essentially done is, and the way that I would measure this um, is I take all my mirrors and I turn them on. So they're all facing the spectrograph. And then I image a star or a pinhole if I'm in a lab setting uh, onto the detector and I take my exposure and I see, all right, to get to such a saturation level, uh, you know, it took me a thousand seconds or, or let's say one second because they're all on. Now what I'll do is I'll flip all my mirrors into the off state. So in a perfect slit mask, I would expect no light to come through, right? If I had like a, an aluminum or a steel plate that's thick, I'm not gonna get anything. Um, so with the DMDs, I wanna characterize how much of the light from those off state um, mirrors come. So if, for example, the way to read this is when I took data, or if you take data at H beta, uh, and I have that H beta filter, so I'm looking at one wavelength, and I wanna see how much light from all those off state um, mirrors uh, go into the on state. If I integrate my camera for 7,831 seconds, I should get to the same intensity level uh, as I did when they're all in the on. So it's essentially what fraction, so it's one eight thousandth of the light uh, from your off state mirrors will go into the on state channel. And that's kind of the, the crosstalk. Um, yes, Ian? So from a practical point of view, what is the source of the scattered light? Is it edge effects on the individual? It, it, it doesn't sound like it is, but maybe it is. Edge effects on the individual mirrors? Is it scattering off of the surface of the mirrors? It, where, where does the scattered light come from? Does it come up from the mechanism that is exposed when the mirror is lifted mm. and then gets scattered? 
So in, yeah, so the question is, what are the mechanisms of scatter? Essentially, what decreases uh, contrast? And the answer is there, there's a lot of different factors um, and I'll answer it two ways. I'll say, what does it in real life and what's doing it in the simulation here? Um, so in real life, the uh, there's the substrate underneath the mirrors and we know that TI does some sort of darkening to them, um, but that should have some sort of scatter, maybe not exactly Lambertian because there's some circuitry down there, uh, but I know they take efforts to darken it. So that is a source of scattering. Um, the surface of the mirrors won't be perfectly smooth, so that'll cause some scattering, and that'll be, uh, you'll see that increase as you go to shorter and shorter wavelengths. Um, and, but what you see here is it's going to be more of the edge effects, and also from the diffraction, uh, when, you, when you simulate these devices, um, the way, I usually try to think of it all in angular space. So when I determine where the diffractive orders are, you can kind of plot them with angle. And when you illuminate this reflective device, you can kind of get a whole hemisphere of light coming out. And you're going to get most of it going in your nominal direction towards where the mirrors are pointing, but you still get some going to the edges. So it's really, it's a mix of uh, edge effects scattering off the edges from and diffraction there, as well as uh, some interference uh, is causing this too at these, you know, pretty wide angles because the light comes in normal. And nominally, it gets reflected. It's 12 degrees, so it comes reflected at 24 degrees. However, some light goes into our aperture at negative 24 degrees, and that can come from diffraction, interference, scatter, et cetera. And that's kind of what's captured here. OK, so here's the model. How does it compare to measured data? And it compares. <laughs> So the, there's a, a not, like usual, there's a few caveats with this. So the measured data here is in situ measurements with SAMOS. So there's a whole optical train. We have re-imaging optics, we have cameras, et cetera, where the simulation essentially has these, a perfect lens uh, is illuminating a micro mirror and a perfect camera is collecting it. So it's not exactly one-to-one, -one, but what we hope to take away from this is we wanna make sure that we're in the right ballpark because I'll show you simulations that go into the, uh, the near infrared and the mid infrared, and the behavior becomes much more extreme with DMDs. So you wanna know that you're kind of operating in a regime where you're not gonna be device limited. And we see pretty good agreement in the blue. Um, so we have, a, we have like a low resolution blue grism in SAMOS. And it just so happens that there's actually very good agreement at H alpha and H beta, but I recognize that the other wavelengths don't have quite the same agreement. Um, but uh, in the blue, uh, you know, we're at the right order of magnitude, and we're looking at a contrast ratio around, you know, 6,000, uh, 7,000. And in the red, uh, we have a lower contrast. And that's expected from the simulation, generally higher in the blue, lower in the red, but it's a bit lower than we expect. Um, and there's, there's two things I'd like to do to put it in perspective. One is uh, the original JWST requirements for micro shutter arrays is at 2,000 to 1. So we're still operate, even though it's lower than we expect, it's still in a pretty good regime up until about 8,500 to 9,000 angstrom. Um, but that's more explainable by our test setup. So unfortunately, uh, we had to use a UV optimized test camera for our spectrograph channel because our instrument is, uh, it's designed for the SOAR telescope and there's an adaptive optics instrument called SAMI there. And we're using the, the CCD for SAMI for our instrument which means we don't have a large 4K by 4K CCD in our tab, or sorry, in our lab to test it with. Um, so we borrowed one from another lab that was using this for UV measurements. And what happens is we get these interference effects. So the, that's the actual spectrum I took with it. Uh, it's supposed to be a black body source. Um, and as you can see, uh, it's got this extreme sinusoidal amplitude changes that's caused by interference in the, the bulk of the detector. Uh, and if you take a picture of the a flat field with that camera, you can see what appears to be an interference pattern across the detector, which actually tells you how flat the surface of the substrate is, but it's not remotely useful for what we're doing, but it's marginally cool. So we have, you know, pretty good agreement with uh, SAMOS, and now we're curious if we can extrapolate these tools uh, for the design of other instruments. Right, because the idea is we don't have, maybe I should emphasize that uh, there, there aren't models for the efficiency. There's like some that are kind of the crude first order ones, but there's no models for the contrast. It has not been simulated before. So a, a marginally close fit is better than the absolute zero fits that we've had before. 
Uh, and part of that is just it's computationally expensive and people haven't taken the time to do these near field finite difference time domain simulations of the micromere array, which is what I showed before. So let's generalize this to instrument design. And now I have these funky color maps. And the way to think of it is I just showed you this data, but I took a slice of it because Samus is an F4. So I took a slice going across. Uh, this is all efficiency. Um, and this shows when I have the many mirrors on, which gives us our diffraction peaks. And this shows the single mirror on. So you don't see those wiggles, as I affectionately call them. And that slice will give you Samos. But the, the trends that you can see from this is when you go to a lower focal ratio, you have a faster beam, you've got a wider angle, um, then the, uh, the effects from the efficiency gets better, ultimately. The amplitude of the wiggles decrease. Um, and generally, you get uh, improvement in efficiency. And now I'm going to go to the near infrared from one to two and a half microns, and you see more of the same trend. Um, and what becomes abundantly clear is the, the interference you're getting. So two things. One, if you look at the top, uh, this is all like geometric fill factor. Your spot is just large compared to your 13 and a half micron mirror, but you're not getting those interference effects. Uh, and then on the bottom, you are getting the interference effects, and you have a mix between the constructive interference and the destructive interference. And you'll notice that you know the, the amplitude here at F28 is much smaller than the amplitude at F8. And remember that the test setup we had before was at F10. Um, so you can see how much it, it changes uh, with different parameters. Uh, and just you know, reemphasizing what I mentioned, uh, you know, decreasing your F number pretty much always helps you. And at the extreme, this is two and a half to five microns. And your spot is now, you know, pretty huge compared to the micro mirror. So if you want a single mirror slit, not a great idea, unless you want, you know, 10% throughput. Uh, and then when you have many mirrors on, uh, you get this interesting regime where this is actually the first order diffraction peak for the micro mirrors. So really what you have now is a switchable diffraction grading. Um, and you know you can do with that what you will. It's an interesting thing. Uh, the light that is kind of uh, blue word of four microns, um, it's not that the light's getting absorbed or anything like that. It's just not going into our collection aperture. So you can get efficiency back if you oversize your collection aperture, in particular if you had like an elliptical collection aperture, uh, because now you're going to collect uh, some of these uh, diffraction modes that you get at like the first order and second order. Um, so there, there's ways around it, but to my knowledge, there's no instruments that are designed like that. Yes. Sorry, in the plot here, is it every other is on, or is it is it designed to be the finest sort of pitched grading? Uh, so the question is about the the grading pitch. Yeah. So the what, what are how are the facets organized? I guess. Um. So the facets are all. I guess I'm not sure I understand the question. So when you um, get this first order diffraction peak, yes. Um, what do the mirrors, what state are the mirrors? So, so the mirrors are all in the on state. So they're all plus 12 degrees. Okay. I'm curious if you went in at 12 degrees, sort of like uh, a Nashalette type grading, mm -hmm. um, do you have a sense of like what the blaze function looks like here? Could you operate ah. this at a higher? Uh, what I can tell you um, is that you can tune where these peaks are based on the incident angle, um, like what you mentioned. And there's other devices that have different tilt angles and pitches, and that will also tune where these peaks are. So different DMDs. So we've also, I've done simulations for the 10 micron ones. Um, we'll have peaks at uh, different wavelengths. Um, so it is somewhat tunable to an extent. And it's much more sensitive to the tilt angle of the mirrors than it is the illumination angle. Um, the illumination angle is kind of like a fine control and the tilt is a coarse control. Did that answer? Yeah. Okay. All right, well, now I'm gonna kind of go into what are some other applications very generally. Um, so there's a technique uh, called Hadamard imaging where you can essentially, um, you generate this Hadamard matrix and then you generate a, a series of slit patterns at the DMD. And through a number of exposures, uh, you can reconstruct a data cube uh, like an IFU. Um, you could place a DMD uh, at your pupil and you can do pupil wavefront control. Um, something that I had played around with was using it to improve uh, ghost analysis. 
Um, generally, the there's not good optical models for doing kind of geometric design and analysis with DMDs. So uh, generating a uh, like a source file out of the DMD simulation lets you do better stray light. Um, and then there's also, uh, you can do really high contrast uh, projectors have been made. So this is from a projector patent, but possible applications include coronography where having really high contrast um, is ideal. And the way this works is uh, not obvious from here. These are DMDs. There's two of them used in series. Uh, and you essentially are able to multiply the contrast ratios by each other in order to get a high, like two and a half million to one um, contrast ratio. And this is a projector that you could go out and buy if you have your own planetarium. So what's some of the science uh, that we'll do with this? Well, the plan is to install the instrument in December and to observe with it in January. And as established, a really good candidate in, uh, a really good candidate to um, take advantage of DMDs and uh, is crowded field spectroscopy. So there's a open cluster uh, with relatively low metallicity that we're interested in uh, in the disk. And we would like to, there's relatively, there's not a lot of measurements made. Uh, there's 126 likely members. Their spectra exists for about 20 uh, of the objects. And we'd be interested in essentially taking more spectra uh, of this relatively young cluster, uh, and then simultaneously being able to do uh, additional photometry with it in order to both act as a test bed for the instrument uh, and look at a, an interesting target at the same time. And this is, you know, primarily, like I said, while let's say we take that hour integration when we're looking at, you know, a subset of, so if we have 106 targets, we won't be able to take them all in one snapshot, but also being able to do, uh, you know, photometry with Sloan and using the uh, the narrow band filters lets us not just have dead time with all the rejected light from the mask. Um, so, and then we'd like to use that to see how metallicity affects uh, mass accretion for some of these uh, young stars. And then uh, kind of generalizing uh, everything that I mentioned. <laughs> um, so DMDs are pretty cool, but they certainly have their drawbacks. Uh, they're poised to um, be quite good for like survey science, crowded field spectroscopy, uh, generally more narrower fields of view um, compared to something we might have at Magellan if we wanted like a wide field spectrograph. Um, and it's just, it's really critical to have a good understanding of how these micromirrors affect, you know, your contrast and your efficiency with respect to wavelengths. Because as pointed out, um, a lot of people want to use these uh, outside of the visible and they were designed for the visible. Uh, so they want to use them in the ultraviolet and they also want to use them in the infrared. And this can be done, but especially uh, important in the infrared is understanding where the drawbacks are uh, and perhaps trying to think a little outside the box with your instrument design in order to recover some of the efficiency uh, that you might lose from some of these diffraction peaks. Um, and this current ongoing efforts, something we're doing at uh, Johns Hopkins is we're creating a better apparatus to rewindow these devices. The devices come prepackaged with a window on them. Uh, and the window has an AR coding for the uh, optical spectrum because they're projectors for movie theaters. So they've been used without, some people uh, have more delicately taken the window off the DMD uh, and they do, <laughs> they do still work, but they're, it's, you know, it's very careful. You don't want to touch it. Meanwhile, when they have the window on, they're very robust. You can drop it. They're not going to break. There's virtually no failure rates amongst the micromirrors. Uh, but what we'd like to do is essentially replace the uh, windows in a very repeatable fashion and put on UV optimized and infrared optimized windows. And uh, there's also a um, facility that's being built at Space Telescope uh, in order to characterize these in the, the ultraviolet, especially scatter. So I'm going to leave you with my appendix. Uh, I talked about a wide field spectrograph. I wanted to mention something really quick because this work is not what I've been working on here at Carnegie. This is what I've been doing at Hopkins, but what I've been working on at Carnegie has been an instrument called Falcon. And Falcon is named because it looks like a bird and it's a nine channel wide field, <laughs> uh, high resolution um, imaging spectrograph for Magellan Bata. And the idea is for this to be a facility instrument, a a uh, wide uh, range of use cases uh, to generally support the uh, observational astronomers here at Carnegie. And what I'm going to do is I will just mention the some of the specs and then I'll go to questions. But it's wide field of view, 500 square arc minutes. It's got a broad wavelength range from 3,300 angstrom, pushing out past 10,000 angstrom. You can go to about 10,500. You're limited by the CCD at that point. 
um, a fairly high uh, efficiency uh, compared to other uh, imaging spectrographs and a wide uh, range of spectral resolutions where you can go from a, in the low res operating mode, you can have a one arc second slit 2345 across the entire wavelength range up to a high resolution 0.4 arc second slit, which it can easily resolve. You're seeing might not, but the instrument can uh, of 11,600. Uh, and you the high resolution is, tends to be done in two snapshots. And then there's also uh, a, a dedicated imager uh, as part of it as well. So. With that absolute information dump, uh, I will be happy to take any questions. All right, any questions? Yep. Super One question. Let me uh, have the microphone off. <laughs> okay, stupid question. Um, when you first showed the picture of the DMD, there were a lot of, you don't have to go all the way back, it's okay, but there were a lot of flaws on it and before it was destroyed. Is that something, oh, wow, fast, yes. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's just like spots everywhere. Is this something that needs to be characterized when taking calibration data or is it just captured in the efficiency? So these spots are just from sitting on a desk for a year. Uh, and from being essentially destroyed. So this is one with a window on, and even though it's a little more zoomed out. Uh, so the question was, um, let me repeat it real quick. It was on the mic, so you don't have to. Oh, it. got it. Okay, we're gonna unbreak it. Uh, <laughs> so in this in this non-broken one uh, with the window on it, you'll see that uh, there's no visible uh, defects on it. And we don't, we haven't witnessed this uh, when using and testing these devices, they tend to be pretty pristine. So, you know, before TI lets anyone touch them, that's why they put the window on it so we can't mess up their beautiful creation. Any other questions? I was the same exact question. Mine was really the same question, but uh, what is the variance in the reflectivity of the different? Yeah, so, um, we haven't, so it's a, it's an aluminum oxide substrate. We haven't seen any variance in reflectivity uh, across micromirrors themselves. You'll take the Fresnel loss at the, uh, the aluminum. Um, but the, the variations we do care about uh, tend to come into uh, how consistently do they tip to 12 degrees? Is that, you know, 12.05 versus, you know, 11.99. Uh, and that'll kind of, uh, that'll affect the image quality. And then also, um, Forgot what I was going to say. Oh, there, there's a very slight curvature, like a peak to valley of 40 nanometers across the face of these. And that's uh, an effect we'd like to characterize as well in terms of the, the contrast and to see how it affects things. And it's asymmetric. It goes about uh, the, the tilt direction um, and it's kind of like elliptical a little bit. So those tend to be the things that more affect things like efficiency. But as far as we can tell, like the actual homogeneity of the surfaces seem excellent and there's no noticeable effects and variation of uh, reflectivity. Of so to Erica's question, so then when you do a flat field, you've got the fringing and you've got some small variance in this, what what kind of level can you flat field to, do you think? Uh, like a percent, half a percent? How, what, what's the highest signal to noise you think you can get out? I mean, you're going to have, you're going to have to get rid of the fringing in your spectra, right? And then you get mm -hmm. rid of this, this thing. And then as, as well, the pixel, the pixel of the CCD. I just was curious what, what that, highest signal to noise might be that you could potentially get out but yeah i'm not um sure exactly i know it's something that um we're we're working on because we're kind of making a pipeline for this uh as we speak and uh flat fielding has been part of it but that's not something that i've worked on so much but something that i can say is um if there's variations uh, about individual micromirrors, they're very consistent. So if it's going to, you know, the 12.1 degrees, it's going to do that every time. Um, so it should be in the fluctuations you see uh, in efficiency with respect to wavelength. These are all very predictable. Uh, there's some slight variation from device to device, but for a given device, if you're able to flat field and, you know, measure the performance across the field, uh, we have not seen that change over time. Um, in over different conditions. We brought these things down to cryo too, uh, and we've done a bunch of testing with them. So they've been very adorable and uh, homogeneous. So, so sorry, that's probably not the exact answer you're going for, but. <laughs> Any more questions? Okay. Thank you. 
Okay, you said this was optimized for optical, which makes sense because the projector kind of technology. Um, is there any way of testing how the efficiency would change if they were coded with something else? Like, could you build them to be optimized for infrared? Uh, yeah, so, well, I could simulate it. <laughs> um, generally, what you would do is if you wanted this to work well in the infrared, or at least better than, um, you know, this, what you should do is you should have larger mirrors. I think in a perfect world, these mirrors would be closer to like 30 to 50 microns across instead of like 13 and a half. Uh, as far as the coatings go, you would like to be able to uh, coat the actual micro mirrors themselves uh, rather than just the, the aluminum oxide. And then it's uh, you will absolutely have to replace the window for something that would be transmissive in the infrared. And sometimes, so there's a lot of efforts to use these in space. So some people, they'll just remove the window and then kind of keep it in a vacuum seal environment. Uh, and that works well, but um, the, they're sensitive to moisture. So if you take the window off, it, because it's all electrostatic, it basically causes like stiction and they'll stop flipping. So you need to do it in a really dry environment. Um, it's controllable, but it's, you know, they're sensitive, they're tiny, there's 2 million of them. Any other questions? I have one last one then. What are you most personally excited about? What do you think is uh, the application that these shine the most in? Like, is it the Hardman masking? and doing IFT type of stuff or? Mm -hmm. um, I do think the the IFT stuff is very interesting. And we we plan to do that with Samos because we've kind of, it's been done in lab settings. Um, most of that's been done out of the Rochester Institute of Technology. Um, but I think for me, I, I like the idea of uh, these kind of, I don't know. I, I personally am very interested in looking at like these, the crowded fields, I think doing photometry and spectroscopy at the same time uh, is pretty neat and kind of efficiently being able to uh, look at clusters that are kind of on the size of the field of view that you can get from these. Uh, I think you can go larger. We have three by three arc minutes, but you can do a larger field of view, but you're always going to be in that ballpark. You're never going to be looking at like half a degree or something like that, which I think a lot of the, you know, if you're going to start doing survey science, you're going to want a bigger field of view. Um, but I just like the idea of efficiently using uh, telescope time for crowded field spectroscopy. And I'm also very interested to see if the, the in-series DMDs with the two and a half million to one contrast could be used for any type of coronography or high contrast imaging and things along those lines, because uh, that has not been done in astronomy and has only been done for commercial stuff. Are there any questions online? Okay. All right. Let's thank Jack and... Uh... Thank you.